In 2019, a peaceful revolution led by the youth took over a military regime that ruled Sudan for more than 30 years. And I'm here today to tell you all about it. Let's start. My name is Muad Usman. I'm Sudanese. I was born and raised in Sudan, and since 1989, I've only been ruled by one president. 30 years of my life under one president, under one ruling, Omar al Bashir. It was very clear to me this ruling wasn't really just. People are always complaining about what's happening in private, nobody talks about it in public. And the simple demonstrations that I've seen while I was growing up in public ended up by people either getting tear gassed, beaten down, or arrested. That's how a regime works. That's how a dictatorship works. It silences every voice that stands against it and controls the media, controls the narratives that get told to everyone that watches TV, listens to the radio, or reads the newspaper. I'm part of controlling the narrative and controlling the media. Whenever something bad happens, whenever the country is going through rough patches, the president gets on stage, he tells a few powerful words, gets himself a paid crowd or a bunch of primary school kids to cheer his name, to hype him up, then he dances on stage. And just like that, everything bad, everything that was said about his ruling, that was bad, goes away. Omar al-Bashir, a man whose career has been defined by war. He led Sudan through various conflicts and during the breakup of Africa's largest country, al-Bashir came to power in a bloodless military coup in 1989, overthrowing a democratically elected government. Sudan was going through several wars since the 80s between the government and people asking for peaceful and equal distribution of wealth. Because big cities like Madani, Khartoum were getting a lot of money distributed in them. Because honestly, the government lives there, the kids of the government and their families lived there. So they needed clean streets, they needed good school, they needed a good health care, which wasn't the best but compared to other cities and other regions that didn't have schools, that didn't have working hospitals, it wasn't just. So people were simply asking for justice. And yes, outside governments and outside forces surrounding Sudan did push for instability and help provide arms, weapons to small groups in Sudan. But again, these people spoke about injustice. The first thing that they demonstrated was injustice. The government didn't fix schools, didn't build hospitals. So the natural thing that happened was retaliation because every peaceful demonstration was faced with jail, was faced with killing, was faced with burning to several villages. This unfortunately led to the separation of South Sudan from Sudan and until this day, were faced with the bad consequences and the bad judgment that the government did for 30 years, separating a part of Sudan, separating a part of us, because our families got separated between the two countries. We lost friends, we lost families, and we lost a part of us. Sudanese pound has sharply depreciated in recent months, and as the prices continue to rise, frustrations too sore. When an item was initially two or three pounds and suddenly it jumps to six or seven pounds, of course we won't be able to make ends meet. For their bread, Sudan's poor are being squeezed by political uncertainty ahead of the referendum and rising with prices on the global market. Sudan imports about two-thirds of its wheat and requires foreign currency to do so. Students have held occasional protests for almost two weeks after the government's austerity measures that led to a rise in prices. Each time they were confronted by security forces and pro-government students. But this may not be enough to stop their anger. Universities are very politically 
actives. Everyone is complaining because the prices are going up and the salaries are going down. And everyone was having a rough bash back then. But again, every demonstration that happened in our university, every peaceful demonstration, I might say, was faced back by tear gas, was faced back by lashing the students, was faced back by arrests. And this went on and on until 2013. Angry protesters accompany the coffin of a student who was shot dead on Wednesday during violent protests against the removal of fuel subsidies. Opposition parties estimate that as many as 60 people were killed in the protests. These demonstrators shout they want to overthrow the government. This man shows bullets he says were fired by security forces. Internet services have been restored after a 24-hour internet blackout that had prevented protesters organizing themselves through social media. I remember vividly we were demonstrating in the Union Square in Shambat and people were shouting against the extreme measures that the regime was taking because at that time with the separation of North Sudan, Sudan lost all the oil that was in South Sudan. The money that was funding the government was funding its wealth, was funding their cars, their houses, buying new weapons for the military. So North Sudan and South Sudan separating and the oil being mostly in South Sudan, that took a lot of funding from the government, that took a lot of money from the government. Sudan is desperately short of cash after its economy lost some 70% of its oil income when South Sudan became independent two years ago. So they needed money somehow. How are they going to get that? Well, from its people. They raised the taxes, they did a lot of extreme measures that put the whole country into extreme poverty. So people were demonstrating and social media was a connection between people. And at that time, al-Bashir and his government decided to use tear gas, they used beating, they used arrests, and they used live bullets to try and scare people back into their homes to try to drive them back from their demonstrations. We're talking about the kids who were in 2013 gassed down, seeing their brothers beaten and arrested. Those kids became men who hated the regime, who hated the government and everything that stood for it. And growing up in the middle of being tear gassed daily and beaten down, that didn't really scare anyone anymore. So the revolution in 2019 stood against bullets, stood against tear gas, stood against military shutdown for the whole country. And with the presence of social media, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, people started sharing videos. People started collaborating and connecting with each other. And it stopped being small protests here and there, Khartoum, Madani, Ashamaliya, or Darfur, and became a revolution in the whole country. And this collective revolution in all the regions in Sudan took over a military regime that ruled Sudan for more than 30 years. People demonstrated peacefully, they spoke their voices truly, and they asked for three things. Riyya, Salam, Adala justice, peace, and equality. No bullets, no tear gas, no arrests or beaten down could stop the thousands, hell, millions that were pushing into the streets because now it wasn't demonstrations from university students alone. It was the young, the old, women, children, all drove to the streets shouting, yasqut, yasqut, hukm al-askar, let the military ruling fall down. On the 6th of April, the people decided to gather and march towards the general military area in Khartoum. People were surprised by the thousands that showed up. Everyone was crying tears of joy. The hundreds of thousands of people that showed up decided not to leave without the government falling down. And indeed, Al-Bashir was forced to step down. People were released from prisons, but that wasn't enough. 
We need to remember the government isn't one person. The government isn't just the ministries and the head ministers. It is the military. All these parts and the security forces were part of the government. And obviously for 30 years with corruption, with payouts, those people became part of the government. And it was in their best interest for the government to stay under military ruling. And that made the people want to stay in the general military area some more until the government and everything that has to do with rule in Sudan is turned over to a transitional government and people could finally have their civilian ruling. <laughs> Nearly a month after ousting its president of three decades, Omar al-Bashir, Sudan's military council and the opposition coalition's attempts to form a transitional government don't seem to be getting easier. The opposition presented the ruling council with its vision for the transitional period in early May. On Tuesday, the military council responded. The document doesn't mention the other political forces that have partaken in the transition that would elect a prime minister and sovereign council members as well as other ministers. It doesn't even mention the transitional military council which alongside the Alliance for Freedom and Change and other forces, we see as important in the election process for these important posts. The military didn't like the sitting and the military forces collaborated to take down the sitting. A raid at dawn, when the protesters least expected it. Sudan's rapid support forces and the police moved in. Shots were fired as unarmed protesters dived for cover. For more than two months, they had protected the sitting outside the army headquarters the symbol of their defiance and their evolution. But for Sudan's military junta, it represented a threat. With hundreds of young people killed, hundreds of them missing, and multiple thousands arrested. And that was the government, or the military, I shall say, showing their force, showing their power, and driving people back to their houses. The military took down the internet, took down the connection between the cities and shut down the roads driving to Madani, Al Jazeera or Al Shamaliya. They ruled every city as individual and they raided houses, they arrested people, they teared gas everyone that was speaking and again with no communication, with not even phone calls working at times. It was very difficult to collaborate. It was very difficult for the people to collectively take down the government once more. But in June 13th, 2019, people collaborated. People agreed to go on one march, the millions march, and showed the military that nothing can stop us. No bullets, no arrests, no tear gas. 
finally the military decided to make the peaceful transition and decided to speak to the force of freedom and change and they signed an agreement for the two years of transitional period until we could have a democratic election in Sudan. Sudan finally seems to be moving towards democracy, having sworn in the 11-member body on Wednesday. Five of them are army generals, the other six civilians, including two women, who run the country for a little over three years until elections are held. It comes after months of political stalemate and a brutal crackdown on protesters who wanted the military to share power after they pushed out longtime leader Omar al-Bashir in April after four months of demonstrations. For 30 years we were isolated. We were treated as a pariah state. We want to tell the world we are moving away from sanctions, uh, issues of uh, punishment and all that. We wanted to be seen as a country that is upholding human rights, good governance, peace, security, at ease with itself and peace and its neighbors. We would like to reach the rest of the world. Please, we left a while for a while, but we are coming back to the fold of good nations. We will have to make it work. There is no other choice. It is in the interest of this country to move forward to allow this partnership to work. Nobody is expecting it to be just a fait accompli and easy. We will have our challenges, but I think there is a, a, a very serious resolve and determination for us to make this partnership work. And we begin with some breaking news, reports of a military coup. A potential military takeover leaves Sudan in turmoil. A coup attempt is taking place in Sudan. The Armed Forces Ministry has said in a statement that the army has detained the civilian prime minister, Abdullah Hamdok. International flights to the capital Khartoum have been suspended, while the internet has been cut. Right now, thousands of people have taken to the streets to protest against Monday's military coup. As dusk fell, protesters remained on the streets of Khartoum refusing to accept that the military is back in charge. And this brings us to what's happening right now in Sudan in 2021. The military has taken over the country, shut down the internet, arrested the prime minister of the transitional period, along with a lot of governmental officials, claiming that the revolution was stalling and the military is going to correct the course of the revolution. Abdel Fattah al-Burhan stopped following orders. He's dissolved the council, becoming the de facto head of Sudan. But like the military had the government for more than 30 years. We actually took over the government or turned down a military ruled government. Changing al-Bashir with someone else doesn't change the whole idea of we don't want military ruling anymore we want a democratic leader a democratic government from the civilians to run the country regardless of what's happening right now in sudan the revolution have reached a point of no return and the people's faith in peaceful change can never go away they saw what was happening in Sudan and what the government was doing and they decided to be the change that they wanted to see for the future. And I pray from my heart that we end up with a civilian government that takes us through the transitional period and ends this period with democratic elections for the people to speak their voice and pick their leader from among them. My name is Muad Osman and you are watching a simple explanation to the Sudanese revolution in 20 minutes. Thank you for watching.